Firstly, thanks so much for hanging around um, for one of the last sessions of the day today. Um, my name is Jill Robb. I am CMO and Director of Marketing at Origin Digital, a um, digital agency based in Hollywood. And we do a lot of work in the insure tech space. And I'm here with a gent um, who has a lot more experience in the insurance space than I do, that's for sure, um, David McKnight. And, um, Today, we're here to discuss digital insurance transforming the customer journey, but I'm going to just take a moment or two and ask David to introduce himself and his experience in the sector. Thank you very much. Can you see me okay? Is that, is that not that mic? No? Not mic on? Can you throw out a battery? Hello? You got it. There we go. Technology, you know, sometimes it doesn't work for you very well. Um, uh, but look, I hope you can see me and hear me all right. I can't see you too well because of the very bright lights um, that we have here. But thanks for the, the introduction, Jill. Yeah. <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit then about your career in the insurance industry, David? Because I know it's a, it's a varied one and it's interesting for me. So I'm sure the guys would like to know a little bit more about that. Uh, yeah, no problem at all. Look, if there's anybody that works within an insurance company or an insurance brokerage um, in the audience here, if I do say anything that isn't factually correct, they just keep it to yourselves and sure you can catch up with me afterwards. But you know, I've been working in the, the insurance software industry now for close to 25 years. Um, uh, and I started out in the programming side of things and the technical side of things then figured out I wasn't a very good programmer, so I moved into the support side of things. And uh, I didn't do too badly at that, but I then moved into the business side of things and into sales. Um, and to be honest, I've always appreciated having a little bit of technical knowledge as I've worked with the customers over the last 23, 24 years. Um, we, for 20 of those years, uh, I worked for an indigenous software house called Relay Software. We supplied insurance software to insurance brokers, uh, and mostly across the Republic of Ireland. And then in 2016, we sold their business to Applied Systems. And Applied Systems are the, the largest provider of intermediary platforms across the globe, market leader in the US, market leader in Canada, market leader in the Republic of Ireland, uh, and very much um, trying to become the market leader in the UK. So we very much support uh, traditional, the traditional uh, way of selling insurance through traditional brokerages, um, although we'll come on to a bit more of the change I've seen over the last 23 years. So interestingly, you know, you say it's tradi traditional systems, but this word insure tech is something that people are talking about. Um, and so how are you using that technology then to really help sort of shape that, you know, in terms of you know, you're a global leader in innovative systems. Um, is it, you know, and that's the customer journey process. Yeah. Um, so how, in terms of, you know, looking back over those last five years, there's probably been a lot of change and I've noticed a lot of change and, and this word insure tech that now everybody's talking about. What's one of the biggest changes that you yourself have seen in that insurance sector in this past five years? Certainly. Well, there's always continuous trends, but the biggest trend over the last five years, or the most significant trend, is the reduction um, of inbound telephone calls and people moving to digital. Like that has, I suppose, it was pretty obvious it was going to happen, and it was happening for the previous five years at a certain pace. But over the last five years, it's been it's been transformational. So, large call centre organisations, maybe 200 individuals answering the telephone, you know, walking you through your insurance quote and handing you price. We've seen organizations like that deal with more customers with maybe half the number of people in their organizations. And the only way they can do that, obviously, is people moving online and servicing themselves and carrying out digital transactions. So that's before, in my, yeah, certainly the biggest shift I've seen in more recent times. So, so here's a question. Do you think that it's a possibility it's all going to move online? Um, no, I think it's the answer. Um, personal insurance, you know, when we talk about personal lines insurance, your, your vehicle insurance and your home insurance, um, certainly private, is there enough data for insurance companies to be able to get you a very accurate price without speaking to you in person? There is, but if we look, if you look at the UK market and the aggregator market, 
where people usually start on a price comparison site. It, you know, it has become so competitive, to be honest, and I hope I don't offend anybody out here who works for a price comparison site. The only people that can make or derive value from that model are the price comparison sites. You know, it's, it is a race to the bottom. Every bit of margin is squeezed out for any other provider. And that's not how you build, build anything long lasting. There has to be value for everyone along the chain. So we have a very large customer in the UK, a company called Aplan, who have very much bucked the trend over the last 10 years, very traditional in how they engage with customers face to face. Um, uh, continuous customer growth, continuous revenue growth, and EBITDA growth, and our, every single insurer wants to work with that intermediary because of, of the quality of business and the quality of client um, that they bring uh, to those businesses. Insurance is a complex um, uh, product, and once you, you know, there's certainly an affluent side of it. There's the person's coming to insure their home, their holiday home, and three vehicles and maybe a boat if you're stretching it a bit further, you know, that's, that's something that they want to talk about. You know, they don't want to, to go online and try and complete that whole complex transaction themselves. So there'll always be um, that business that will be fully online and that that isn't. And I think that's a point to note that, you know, digital is not necessarily there to replace people in the insurance industry, you know, and, and technology is not there to replace people because it's very difficult to replace that. Um, but one of the things that we have seen are a lot of drivers of change, and, and you'll maybe be more acutely aware. Um, you talked about aggregators in the UK market. You're exposed to the US market and so on. So what other drivers of change has really helped rapidly change the technology in the insurance sector? Well, I think all change is driven by the consumer at the end of the day, so the consumer expectation. and. Um, you know, we certainly don't compare ourselves to our competitors in terms of our own aspirations. We don't, you know, it's a pretty niche vertical market what we do, so we don't have hundreds of competitors, but those uh, that we do have, we certainly don't look to see what they are doing um, to see if we can do it a bit better. At the end of the day, you're competing with Amazon, you know, you're competing with that convenience, um, and that's what you need to bring to those consumers, um, as I say. I've lost my train of thought a little bit, but certainly consumers <laughs> drive change. Um, and I guess I suppose that the speed of technological change in total is, is of, uh, you know, we notice it ourselves, um, you know, on a daily basis, um, you know, even speaking with customers in Zoom all of a sudden. Yes. Um, and I'm sure that that was quite a shift because, again, I apologise to any insurers that are there, but um, if we think about even a traditional um, market model, it's in branch and it's in person and um, there has been a big shift and a big uptake. You've mentioned two C's, consumers, competitors. I'm going to mention the big C, COVID. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. How has that impacted? Well, I think, yes, it's certainly expedited everything in, in terms of the digital. I think if you talk, you know, another business to work with, a very traditional business in, in the Republic on post insurance, which is really the post office and people have the ability to go in and, and talk about their insurance needs within the post office. Well, those post offices simply weren't open for many months of the pandemic, so an awful lot of those people that wanted that um, traditional experience simply couldn't have it. So they were forced, for want of a, a better word, to, to interact online. And funny enough, they were able to do it. They got used to it. And even when the, the post offices did open again, you know, people had changed their behaviours, had changed their habits. Um, uh, and we're operating in a different way. So we've seen that across the board. Um, COVID certainly hasn't been something restricted to these islands. So in the, the US and Canada, a very similar trend where people were, were more than happy to, to interact face to face. They were forced to move online and, and more than likely that's where they'll stay for the majority of their transactions. And even outside of insurance software, I don't think I'll ever take a flight over to the States again for a two-day trip or a three-day trip. You know, the world certainly changed in that respect. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree with that. Well, one of the things, actually, that just I'd like you to touch on, the insurance sector in the US and the insurance sector in the UK are two very different sectors. Which would you consider the innovating leader? Um, I think, as when we were talking about this earlier, you know, it's what defines innovation. Um, 
the insurance market in the UK, certainly in personal life insurance, is the most technologically advanced. You know, it's by far the most price competitive. And there's continuous technical innovation uh, to drive that forward. The insurance industry in the US is probably by far the most profitable <laughs> um, uh, market. Um, there's less technical innovation in uh, personal lines insurance, but there's actually more technical innovation in commercial insurance. So like one of our products in the US, um, the self-service product that we have, its creation or what really supported its growth in early days was the idea of, of a tradesman having their insurance cover on their handheld device. Right. So again, different, you know, if you walked in um, on the building site in Belfast and asked the guys to produce their insurance certificate, you're on, uh, I think they maybe have to phone home and see who's got it. Whereas in the States, if somebody walks on the building, uh, you know, if the authorities walk on site and ask for your insurance cover, you have to have it. Or they'll shut the site down. So again, a very different, so that's, the need drives the technology. You know, that was an obvious need uh, and that drove that, uh, that technology and that advancement at the time. So. I guess in that case, that's a case of legal driving the tech in that one instance where there's laws associated with that, you know, driving that rather than consumer need on the commercial perspective. Um, from a sort of disruption perspective, you know, she said, you know, that it's need that kind of does that. We're hearing a lot about disruption in the finance space and the whole evolution of fintech. Um, there's obviously, you know, the evolution of insure tech um, and that coming down the line. Is there room for more innovation? Um, I think there's there's always room for more innovation. I think what we'll see, and as, as we see the world changing, it's going to become much more dispersed. Um, you, you know, organisations like my own. 20 years ago tried to be everything to, to everybody or everything to, to the end customer, the brokerage or the insurance company. And that has changed dramatically. You know, our whole ethos is to provide an open platform to allow innovators, insure tech, all these really smart people around the world that are developing very smart technology um, to be able to bring their products and support what at the end of the day are probably mutual customers, you know, our existing customers have the need for better technology. Uh, we provide that core platform, you know, the basics of what they need to do their business. Um, and we will be doing it for another 35 years. You know, the investment, the insurer connectivity, all of those things take millions, if not tens of millions of pounds to put in place. So the barriers to entry are, are strong, but we also can't provide them everything far from it. There's so much opportunity for innovation, for new companies to do smart things that we're not doing. And as I say, it's providing an open platform allows our customers to, to get the best of both worlds. There, there has been a, a few sort of conversations around AI and insurance. Um, what are your thoughts and, and your knowledge on that front? You know, how does, how does it fit? I still haven't figured it out. <laughs> you know, but um, uh, no, it's look. Well, artificial intelligence, what, what can it mean? You know, the, the basic form of it, the we've chatbots in place, that you're speaking, you know, the, the person speaking, given some of their data, and we're able to, to use the data we already have in the systems to put together a reasonable conversation that sounds like an engaging conversation. I think machine learning, in terms of the volume of data that is processed in the insurance world, the, the interactions there are, the transactions um, that go through, the amount of predictive modeling that can be put in place. You know, no one can predict the future, but there's an awful lot of data which allows us to take a pretty good stab at it. And that's very poorly utilized at the moment. Funny enough, the companies that are thriving are making good use of it, uh, and those that aren't um, uh, are making less. So there's That'll, it'll just become a standard, a need, you know. So certainly anybody that's investing or creating um, uh, smart data products, um, I'm all ears, and uh, you've probably got into a good business or a good sector. 
Uh, it's an interesting point, though, that those, you know, so those insurance companies or traditional brokers or traditional companies, you made the point there that the ones that are incorporating new technologies are the ones that are thri thriving. For the ones that aren't, what's the barriers? Why, why are they not taking on new technologies? I think they probably the biggest barriers are, are fears, you know, and it's not, certainly when I talk to what I would count as friends, like customers that have become friends who are exiting the business, it's really not what they got into the business for. You know, it was, for many years, it was a relationship industry. They knew the CEO, you know, if they were in the brokerage side, they knew the CEO of every insurance company. You know, they went to a lot of black tie events every year. You know, it was the whole lifestyle type of business. And, you know, a lot of that is disappearing, like a lot of things. So certainly there'll be people just say, I don't want to sign up to this new world, you know, and that's, those businesses, will, as I say, they won't thrive, you know, and they'll be, and certainly what we see in the UK is a lot of those lifestyle businesses are being acquired and it's starting now in the Republic by consolidators. So, you know, there's lots of innovative, thriving businesses that will more than happily take your client base off you, you know, um, uh, and pay you for it and give you a very straightforward way of exiting the insurance industry if that's what you want. And that's really the trend. Uh, and we're going to see more and more of that. The, the big businesses are going to keep getting bigger and bigger, and the consolidation is going to continue to happen at pace because scale gives them tremendous opportunities to leverage technology, invest in technology, uh, and bring efficiency. So that, that trend is going to continue. And interestingly, I, I, you know, in the fintech space, we, we talk about neo banks and we talk about challenger banks and, and all of that type of thing. And I know that certainly, you know, five years ago, we might have been talking in the finance industry about how these challenger banks with their new systems, they were technology companies that also did banking rather than, you know, banks that did technology. And, um, you know, it, I think that there's maybe a juxtaposition with the insurance space there just to chat about. How, are there those bigger companies that are struggling with those legacy systems? And how do you how do you read that out? How do you make yourself more open yeah. to incorporating these new technologies aside from the fear? Yeah, well, no, certainly, big successful companies usually have technical debt legacy systems, and there's sense like those insurance companies that uh, I've seen successfully um, execute technical transformation projects. I don't know if I've seen one yet. You know, it's, it is an extremely, because a lot of those companies and certainly the behemoths have came about via acquisitions. So, you know, there could have been 10 um, uh, insurance companies 10 years ago. They'll, every chance they'll still be running on 10 different systems. You know, they'll put a new skin on it and they'll put a bit, a bit of sticky tape on it to try and pull it together. But actually bring about that complete transformation uh, is extremely challenging. What often you'll see these larger brands do is buy innovative companies. So you you know you've got somebody that's put in that sweat equity, you know, has innovated and created something very special uh, on a technology front, and the larger, more established, and more cash-rich companies will will acquire that and leverage that um, uh, to push themselves forward. Yeah. Are there? Any areas currently that you think are relatively untouched in the insurance space that actually needs innovation or that you think would benefit from it? Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a huge need. Well, in the Republic of Ireland, there's a huge need for more competition. You know, there's a lack of competition, which certainly doesn't drive innovation. And you could say exactly the same in, in our wee country, you know, um, being part of the UK doesn't necessarily mean we benefit from all of the competitive nature of the GB market. You know, there's a lot of offerings and products that simply aren't here. Um, you know, commercial SME insurance, getting insurance for your office, getting your insurance uh, for your shop or your hairdressers, it's just a completely different experience in the GB market than it is anywhere in this island. So there's always, you, you don't have to be a genius to to, you know, simply looking at other markets um, can tell you where the needs are in this market. But certainly, business insurance, um, you know, is, is, it's very poorly administrated at the moment. There's a lot of opportunity to change that. 
And one area you touched on, actually, that, that I'd be interested um, just to sort of have a chat about, um, because it was mentioned actually in a session earlier on, a totally different session, but you'd mentioned about it being a very traditional model and going to black tie dinners and so on. Um, and I've met quite a few of your team members now, and you've got a lot of women working for you. you know, so how important is diversification? Um, and you know that that type of approach within applied systems itself. You know, you, you do seem to have quite a lot of diversity in the business. Yeah. Well, look, we're. You know, I think we always prided ourselves in diversity, even when we were um, uh, a small local business. And we, were, we weren't that small, but um, and it's just, you know, I think that the ethos has always been to to get the right person for the job, regardless. Um, uh, so that continues and then that's automatically going to bring a diverse workforce in and certainly as a, a global organization and a, a US headquartered organization there's a big focus on it you know it's not just about um, uh, getting the best person for the job it's going that bit further than that to what can be done to have a more diverse workforce and how we engage not just with our people but our customers um, but yes, we, um, we are very much open for business, very much trying to grow our business here um, uh, in Belfast. We have around 120 people today. We recently moved into a new facility in Adelaide Exchange, although we haven't seen much of it. Because we all uh, operate out of our home offices. Um, and our growth in the GB market will drive an awful lot more um, growth in our own sort of team here in Belfast. So if there's anybody wanting to come and work in the insurance industry, in the insurance software industry, um, uh, feel free to get in contact with me. Uh, Except for my team. Yeah. <laughs> um, on that front, so you, and the, the diversification is one thing, but you actually, you, you're doing a lot obviously in the, the software innovation side of things. How do you, how do you foster innovation within a, I would imagine that comes from the US as well as locally? Yeah. Well, it just has to be at the centre. You, it's repeated, you know, keep on telling your people that you expect them to innovate, you know, and challenge the status quo. Um, it doesn't happen. It's about your culture. You know, if you don't, if you don't allow people to make mistakes, um, uh, you know, they're never going to learn. Um, so I think you have to, you have to be willing to take a few risks, yes, and, and some of them are probably smiling, really, down the back, but Certainly, as a mature business, you're going to have lots of customer commitments. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to have lots of people um, you feel dictating what you need to do. And yes, it can be challenging to get the, the the amount of time you want to focus on innovation. But no, if you don't, it's the old boss just to always say, if you, if you don't grow, you go, and if you if you don't innovate, you're dead. Um, so you just have to make it. It's a mindset, you know. To, to bring it about. Yeah. And in terms of the, the future, um, you know, what is it that you see coming down the line? You know, what are the what are those sort of disruptions that you see that, that they're heading straight for both you and the insurance sector? Um, I just I don't think any of us can ignore the Amazons or the Googles of the world or how organizations like that are leveraging data, how the, the bigger are getting bigger. The behemoths, you know, um, and at the end of the day, you drive out at Tesla, and just last week Tesla came forward and said they would start bundling uh, insurance with their car sales. There's absolutely no doubt about it. The most accurate way you can charge somebody for insurance is to analyze their driving and have that data. You know, insurance pricing is a pretty broad brush approach which is pretty crude you know what age are you what kind of car are you driving etc you know all those questions that you're asked when you're trying to insure your car but at the end of the day there's an awful lot of lots of data lots of historic data you know but the moment you buy that policy and you take that car out onto the road the the insurer's little knowledge about what you're going to Whereas if you're looking at data that tells you exactly what the person did yesterday, the day before, the day before that, the day before that, and every day since they bought the car, you have a pretty good idea what they're going to do tomorrow and the day after. So data, I think, as we all know, and look, I, do, I as an individual don't feel at all comfortable that um, big business has such an insight into um, 
what I like to do, but I don't think there's any way of getting away from it unless you want to take yourself off the grid, and that's a big, a big lifestyle choice. Um, but yeah, it'll be driven by data and changing models. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of talk about data and, and data privacy in particular, um, and I guess that poses a, a huge challenge, I get, you know, in terms of the data privacy side of things. Yeah, look, the GDPR as it was introduced to Europe, and the um, if if you if you live and work in Europe for the North um, a North American company, which is domiciled in North America and driving a lot more revenue in North America, you're going to hear a lot about GDPR because the rules are pretty simple. If, <laughs> if you mess up, we have the right to fine you. And the fines are excessive because it's, it's a percentage of your global turnover, not what you're actually earning in that jurisdiction. So yeah, we're pretty, um, I don't know how many um, times a year we have to do our privacy training, our security training. Um, uh, and, and as an organisation, you have to take it incredibly seriously. Um, and that's not going to go away. It's only going to get bigger. If we have any uh, budding InsureTech founders in the audience, would you have any advice for them? Um, certainly, well, I think the advice I give to everybody in business is um, keep it simple, stupid. I don't know if it's Everybody in the audience has heard about the KISS, KISS uh, methodology, which is, comes, I think it comes from the US Naval Sirens, and it's all about every system should be intuitive, should be straightforward, should be able to be used by anybody. You know, technology can be incredibly powerful and it can be um, incredibly smart, but if it's not intuitive, you know, to the end user, it's pretty worthless. You know, if you have to be a software to develop yourself to actually use the software, there really isn't a great market for it. So keep it simple. Don't try to do everything. Um, insurance companies, insurance brokers, they're pretty conservative. So um, they like, in, in my experience, you know, they like to be involved. They like to be able to touch it and feel it and understand it. Yes, everybody's looking for, for automation but they're not necessarily expecting the machine to do everything for them and make them a, a cup of coffee when they get out of bed. You know, everybody wants efficiency, but human beings want to feel part of the process and be involved in the process. So if you can, and also don't expect third parties or dependencies like insurance companies to automatically endorse or just uh, take on your idea because it is a fantastic idea, you know, just be that little bit cynical, you know, that uh, these industries have done things this way for a long time and although there's an obviously a better way with technology, just think they're on a journey, you know, can we get alongside them in that journey um, uh, and bring them, if you want to get them to Z, maybe you have to take them from A to F to, to J along the way uh, and just, yeah, it's that was lots of words of advice rather than three words of advice. But that general thing, keep it simple and um, don't try and change the world overnight. Great, thank you so much, David. Our time is now up, unfortunately. I don't even think we have time for questions. The conversation kind of ran away with us a little bit there. Um, but I'd like to thank you all for your time and over, David, to you as well. Thanks for those wise words of advice for anybody in that market. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Look, um, I'm, I'm assuming my contact details are about somewhere. So if anybody does have a query, feel free to um, uh, email it in or send it in, and I'll be happy to answer it. Okay? Cheers. Now.